right, good morning everyone. Dr. Randall Gates, board certified chiropractic neurologist, also a chiropractic physician at Gates Brain Health. And today we're talking about depression and glutamate. And I'm going to see if I can get into the Facebook Live and say hi to everybody who's joining. So why are we talking about glutamate? What is glutamate? Glutamate is the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. <clears throat> so you have many different neurotransmitters. There's many different neuropeptides, but simply people will commonly talk about like serotonin. They'll talk about norepinephrine. They'll talk about dopamine relative to depression. You've heard me talk about it. You haven't heard me talk about glutamate that much, but glutamate is very important we're finding for depressed patients. So glutamate excites your neurons. It's the primary excitatory neurotransmitter in your brain. And what we're going to talk about today is how the effects of chronic stress alter glutamate signaling. And now within the world of neuroscience, <clears throat> doctors are utilizing new medications, new supplements that affect glutamate. And we're actually seeing some pretty dramatic changes in brain function. Uh, outcomes with depression, outcomes with addiction, outcomes with volumetric changes in the brain, where the brain actually gets more dense. Summarizing simply what's going on in the brain with a depressed patient, uh, there are many things going on. It's multifactorial. It's not one, one phenomenon. It's not just one chemical deficit. Typically, there is an enlargement in the fear center because those of you who listen every week know that I talk about this because it's not commonly known. The fear center is way deep down in your brain. It's called the amygdala, and the amygdala tends to hyperactivate. It tends to enlarge. It's right next to the memory area. The memory area is one of two areas in your brain that makes new brain cells all the time. And so this fear center grows into the memory area's neurological real estate that activates your hormonal system to make much more cortisol potentially much more adrenaline and through time those elevated stress hormones feed back and they literally damage brain cells in your frontal lobes as well as the memory area which then kind of takes away the brake pedal so to speak for this mechanism so it just keeps going and going and going so that is the neurobiology of depression this is a multi-part series we've talked about the microbiome and obesity and hormones and Hashimoto's and gluten and how all these different seemingly remote factors can affect the brain, but now we go into glutamate. So this is a great article out of the journal Neuron. It's from Yale, where they say, altered connectivity and depression, GABA and glutamate neurotransmitter deficits and reversal by novel treatments. So I think it's important that we at least read part of this. Uh, I, I don't like it when PowerPoint presenters just read off the PowerPoint. But I think there are some powerful statements here. I'll just read the first few sentences. The mechanisms underlying the pathophysiology and, and treatment of depression and stress-related disorders remain unclear. But studies in depressed patients and rodent models are beginning to yield promising insights. Those studies demonstrate that depression and chronic stress exposure, chronic stress exposure, cause atrophy of neurons in the cortical and limbic regions implicated in depression and brain imaging studies demonstrate altered connectivity and network function in brains of depressed patients. So what is the limbic system? Your limbic system is basically the middle part of your brain. It really is your cingulate gyrus which borders the corpus callosum. This is your emotional processing area. There are other deeper circuits in the temporal lobe down where the memory area is in the parahippocampal region and different areas like that. But you can see here that they're just right out of the gate basically saying that the pathophysiology and treatment of depression and stress-related disorders remain unclear. And you'd be thinking, well, don't we know more about it? And the reality is, is that through time, researchers have had to come to grips with the fact that antidepressants, if, if depression was just a chemical model, that if you were to take an antidepressant, which theoretically boosts your, your serotonin levels in the brain, or it boosts your dopamine levels in the brain that you would feel better instantaneously. And while some people have that effect, most do not. 
most tend to get better over a matter of weeks, which has led neuroscientists to scratch their heads and say, okay, what is going on? Which led to kind of a, a tearing down, so to speak, of the theoretical framework of what depression is and then building it back up. And what they built back up is exactly what I mentioned, to where the memory area atrophies, the stress response gets turned on, and then that's what they're saying here. These studies demonstrate that depression and chronic stress exposure cause atrophy of neurons in cortical and limbic regions, meaning we lose brain density. Think of, think of uh, 20 people in a room and they put their hands together and all their fingers are together. Now think if they did this. That's literally what's going on with your brain cells when you're exposed to chronic stress particularly in the frontal lobes, particularly in the memory area and other areas of the limbic system. Ironically, with chronic stress, the fear center gets more reinforced with its dopaminergic activity, as well as other areas like the ventral tegmental area. So lots of times it's like the evil dictators of the nervous system, they get reinforced by stress, but then the brake pedal, so to speak, for that evil dictator loses ground. Okay, and I always love to point this out just because I don't think it's commonly recognized and there's such a, well, there's at least a perceived stigma with depression because patients who have depression look normal and for those who have never experienced depression, those who maybe were told to stifle their emotions from a young age, Basically, we'll look at someone who's depressed and say, well, what's wrong with you? You know, your life is good or it's not that bad. There are people who have it worse. And the intense mental anguish and pain associated with depression or the inability to feel joy associated with depression um, are, can be incredibly profound. And until somebody is in that state, I don't think really they can probably perceive it or understand it. But I always like to highlight that depression is a major issue, not only in the United States, but across the world. Here, over 300 million, excuse me, I got something in my ear. There are over 300 million people, over 300 million people are affected by major depressive disorder and limitations in the access to an effectiveness of major depressive disorder treatment have made it the leading cause of disability worldwide according to the World Health Organization 2017. No matter where you stand now in the World Health Organization, we'll just go with the fact that over 300 million people are affected by major depressive disorder. And you can see and limitations in the access to and effectiveness of major, dis major depressive disorder treatment have made it the leading cause of disability worldwide. So this is from Yale. This is a top neuroscience journal. This is the journal Neuron. So it's not like I'm making it up and lots of times I think I think a natural question would be, well, why is a functional neurologist, you know, I'm a board certified chiropractic neurologist that's referred to as functional neurology, why is a functional neurology talk why is a functional neurologist talking about depression? I should have brought some water in. And the reason why is because you can see chronic stress is a huge piece that they don't really know what to do with. And in this article they talk about how you know, mainstream treatments haven't proved as effective as we want them to. Limitations in the access to and effectiveness of treatment for depression. Uh, so we have to kind of begin to think outside the box and functional neurologists, that's what we do. They go on to say, you know, this heterogeneity likely reflects multiple underlying genetic, metabolic, metabolic being, you know, thyroid, gluten, gut microbiome, obesity endocrine, your thyroid function, prediabetes, and neurobiological factors that contribute to depression and are expressed in changing ways across the lifespan. So here, up here they talk about how, you know, 37% of depression seems to be heritable, but that doesn't explain all of it. So depression is such a multifactorial illness. Okay, so relative to today's discussion, now we're to the meat and potatoes. This is a diagram looking at basically the signaling of glutamate. Again, I said glutamate is the major excitatory neurotransmitter of the nervous system. Here they talk about glutamate levels and excitotoxicity. Excitotoxicity is a term and phenomena popularized by Dr. Russell Blaylock 
Dr. Russell Blaylock, I believe is his name. He's a neurosurgeon and he came out and he wrote a book called Excitotoxins, saying that there are certain chemicals we consume in our environment, artificial sweeteners, that pose a risk as excitotoxins, where they activate glutamate signaling in the brain and they cause our brain to overactivate itself, basically. And it's just like, okay, you want to drive your car, you want to be able to go 65 miles an hour on the freeway, you don't want to stand on the brakes and just hit the gas. What's going to happen? If you do that, you're going to burn rubber, you're going to have smoke coming off your tires, and it's going to be really hard on the engine. That's an analogy of excitotoxicity. So we want brain cells to work. We don't want brain cells to be revving at 7,000 RPMs. And so that's excitotoxicity. So here, what this model demonstrates is that this is a healthy neuron. See, it has all these dendritic connections. Dendrites are like the fingers that reach out to touch another neuron. So like this analogy right here would be a dendrite of another brain cell. So just think, you know, you're grabbing my hand and I'm grabbing so-and-so's hand. That's kind of how neurons work. So here we see the dendrites are nice and long and bountiful and thick. And it, this neuron is receiving signaling. And so then because of the signaling, it's going to secrete glutamate. Just think of these as like water balloons that then puke out glutamate into this. This is called the synapse. And then the glutamate is going to bind to different receptors. There's amper receptors, there's kinate receptor, kinate receptors, there's NMDA receptors. And so when glutamate binds to NMDA receptors, it's a little bit more, you can think of it as a pow more powerful and sustained signaling mechanism. Um, it's G-coupled receptors and calcium signaling within the neuron itself but basically just think of it as that the NMDA receptor activates a lot of stuff downstream and it keeps getting activated. <clears throat> so this is a healthy neuron and once the glutamate's out here it's going to get bro broken down and it's going to go back into the neuron. When we're under chronic stress this is what happens. We lose dendritic growth basically the dendrites get pruned back they atrophy that's basically how it's referred to we have reduced glutamate signaling because again it's just like after you did your brake stand in your car and you were burning rubber now there's not as so much rubber on the tires and now maybe your engine's a little bit hot and it's not going to function as well maybe your oil's low so to speak and so this is the result of what chronic stress then does to these neurons because in essence what's thought to happen is that when you're under chronic stress then you accumulate too much glutamate out here it actually overexcites this neuron and this neuron to the point where they stop making receptors and they're stopping they're not able to make glutamate <clears throat> and as a consequence now we have an atrophied or shrunken neuron shrunken dead rights where this brain cell is not able to signal as much down to this guy so that's where chronic stress is so huge. And on Saturday, we're talking about childhood trauma, not to emphasize that issue, but to help people to understand lots of times where the whole stress response started. And the stress response may have started earlier in life, and then it was going too high. It was functioning at too high of a level for the rest of that person's lifespan. And then other events happen, and then they get stuck into this chronic stress mode, and they have a hard time getting out of it. So this illustrates how the chronic stress then overexcites the neuron to where then it becomes in kind of a what we'd say a quiescent state it's not functioning as well as it could so that is basically the neurobiology of glutamate signaling so what's being done medically they're now using different medications that they would have used like an anesthesia previously now they're using them for depression they're having some promising results they're referred to as rapid acting antidepressants <clears throat> So that is now an option where it binds to the NMDA receptor. It seems to almost like jumpstart the neurons. Like if you were to shock someone's heart back into life, it literally seems to do that. There are also supplements that are showing a lot of promise having this effect. So working in functional neurology, we work with the natural side of things. Uh, I'm very focused on certain supplementation protocols that can affect glutamate signaling. And these supplements have been shown to improve like literally the density of different areas of the brain. So supplements. So supplements can be very powerful 
also. So I'm not saying I have a cure for depression, but I am saying these supplements I use come from a lot of peer-reviewed scientific literature and have been shown to affect the brain positively. So that's today's discussion. And if you have other questions about treatment-resistant depression or depression in general, go back and watch the rest of our playlist on YouTube on this matter. And, um, and yeah, I think if, if you're tired of the mainstream model or if you don't feel it's working for you, I think exploring these other options, as mentioned in the slide above, looking at the heterogeneity of genetic, metabolic, and endocrine factors, I think could be really, really powerful. And we've talked about genetics, we've talked about all these things. So thank you everybody for watching. I'll just see if we have any comments on Facebook. Oh, good morning to everybody. Good morning, good morning. Uh, thank you all for joining. Yes, yes, yes. And mm -hmm. trying to understand the brain. Yep. I'm with you. I'm with you. I, I think we're getting closer to having, well, let me say it this way. I'm, I'm with you in that pursuit to try and figure out how to help people who are persistently rocking. I'm with you there. Um, can I give a pre brief list of supplements that I think are beneficial? So yeah, so there's a lot of information now about like serine and Alzheimer's. So you can look up L-serine. Um, that's used for depression and acetylcysteine is used for depression. Actually, I should say L-serine is more used for memory. There's a gentleman, I think he's a botanist from Harvard and he was studying these bats in Guam. So there's a, there's a different type of Parkinson's disease with dementia that affects people in Guam at a very, very high rate. And uh, I'm drawing a blank on it. I think it's called Ludibotig uh, Parkinson's dementia. Um, don't quote me on that. But anyways, this one type of Parkinson's dementia seems to affect this certain amino acid sequence that's in bat poop. Then they consume a lot of bat poop somehow in their diet. And so anyways, he figured out that serine, L-serine, dramatically can improve the memory area. So that's one supplement, n acetylcysteine um other ones are you know active b9 5 htp it just depends on the situation so those would be the things i say but um it seems like serine derivatives and n-acetylcysteine derivatives have some effect on glutamate okay um lion's mane mushrooms i'm not sure about lion's mane mushrooms i'm not sure about psilocybins i really should get more familiar with that but as always i'll tell you if i don't know um, and what I do know, so I need to do more research on mushrooms. Okay, so thank you everyone and have a great day and we will talk to you later.